Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. It's a great delight uh, for me to be introducing our speaker today, uh, Jane C.S. Long, who I knew when she was only Jane Long about 25 years, starting about 25 years ago. I guess that's the price of fame, uh, fame uh, Jane. She started with a BS degree from Brown University, uh, probably one of the first uh, females to do so. Uh, PhD from UC Berkeley, uh, worked at Berkeley National Labs for a while. Uh, then went to uh, be the Dean of Engineering at uh, University of Nevada, Reno, and then my great fortune is when she was the Associate Lab Director for Environment and um, Energy at uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs. Uh, she actually had a division with about 230 people at her own building uh, that held all those people, including me, part-time uh, for a while. Uh, and then uh, moved from that position at the lab into strategic studies. And then uh, as she left that, got into more strategic studies, which is one of my favorite uh, things to be doing. Uh, and now uh, consults for the Environmental Defense Fund as a visiting researcher at UC Berkeley, co-chair of the task force on geoengineering at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And uh, most importantly, I think for the, today's talk, the chairman of the California Council on Science and Technologies, uh, California Energy Futures uh, Committee. I've always envied uh, people in and around the California Council on Science and Technology because of the work they do. And today, Jane's gonna talk about a CCST study uh, that she organized, uh, honchoed, uh, coordinated, uh, uh, called the SB 100 Pathways Project. So with great, um, uh, much less to do and great affection. It's my pleasure to introduce my former boss, Jane C.S. Long. Jane. Hey, thanks, John. It's uh, wonderful to be here with you today. And it's great to see you again, John. It's been too long. Um, John mentioned this is a study that we, uh, a collaborative study that we've put together on SB100. And uh, uh, it, it was a collaboration between the Environmental Defense Fund, the Clean Air Task Force, E3, which is a consultancy, and uh, Princeton University and Stanford University. And it was a self-organized project. And I think it's kind of important because we didn't write a proposal to say, here's what we want to do. We deliberated what the questions were as well as how to answer them. And I think that made a huge difference in the product. So uh, basically we were looking at the situation where California had passed SB 100 requiring the state to go to zero electricity uh, sales, retail sales by uh, 2045. And we said, well, how are you gonna get there? Especially in light of the governor's executive order requiring the whole economy to be carbon neutral. So how can you affordably and reliably um, uh, get rid of the carbon from electricity by 2045? The project design was to basically end up using three different optimization models. And each of these models uh, identified strategies for meeting electricity demand. So they're all, um, all of them were created reliable energy systems, reliable electricity systems, and they also had to eliminate emissions. So those were the, the um, constraints. And then they uh, ran these models with and without a class of energy called clean firm power. And clean firm power is defined as power that's available whenever you need it for as long as you need it. So in some cases, they ran the models without allowing this kind of power. So it would be mostly wind and uh, solar energy, and then gradually add in and, and batteries, and then gradually add in other forms of um, generation. Then because the constraints were that it had to be reliable, as well as um, minimize the cost, you could evaluate the uh, impacts on cost of the various uh, portfolios and how fast uh, the build out would have to be, what kind of land use they would require and some storage and transmission. Um, uh, uh, sorry, my, my uh, finger is a little tricky, trigger happy here. So uh, you can evaluate the, um, these factors and compare the different models. So you can compare what constraints, the, how the constraints you place on the portfolio affect uh, cost, land use, transmission, et cetera. So three different models, they actually did things uh, slightly differently. The E3 model is one that's used in California extensively as a consultancy. A lot of the policy work in California is supported by E3. 
Stanford with uh, E.J. Bake, a Sally student, did a fantastic job with the Stanford model herbs. Uh, and then the Princeton model was Gen X. And uh, they all looked at slightly different geographies as kind of illustrated here. I won't go into too much detail, but um, slightly different geographies and slightly different ways to optimize and make their calculations. And this kind of summarizes the differences um, so they're all linear program, linear models. They all uh, have a different temporal kind of spatial and temporal resolution that they looked at. Um, the only one that looked all uh, WEC wide was the Princeton model. Uh, the most limited in terms of geog geography was E3. Um, they did, they all included neighboring states in some way and they all had rules about uh, imports that you couldn't take more than four, your fair share and that you're not allowed really to cause emissions to go up anywhere else. So that was all, um, again, just to reiterate, system always meets demand and the total cost of the system is minimized in all of these models. They just do it a little differently. So uh, we made some assumptions about what it was going to look like in 2045 that electricity electrification was going to go and that was essentially going to roughly double the demand, which is a pretty common assumption in California planning. Um, the, for the future costs were based on what we found in the literature, mainly uh, work that has been done by NREL. And uh, as I mentioned, nothing in California can cause a problem someplace else. So you can't um, solve your problem by, uh, as, as the city of San Francisco did there, we're going to have zero carbon electricity because we're going to stop selling our Hetch Hetchy power to anybody else. That would cause somebody else's emissions to go up. So you can't do things like that. Um, and also when you go to zero, there are no offsets. Um, you know, zero is zero. So we, we, we did not allow offset solutions. Um, and uh, as I said before, we're no constraints on land use and no constraints on transmission. So these become things that we can compare. The resources that we allowed um, are in the portfolios were on the left, the um, variable resources, uh, wind, solar, small hydro and batteries. And then we gradually allowed the use of uh, firm or uh, clean firm power sources of energy. So carbon capture and storage or advanced nuclear, zero carbon fuel. We didn't actually look at geothermal explicitly, but geothermal would qualify and would act much like CCS. And to, to be clear, these, um, the role that these play in the energy system is for some of these uh, sources, for example, for zero carbon fuel, we don't have to differentiate where that fuel came, comes from in terms of these models. We just look at it as a price range for different kinds of uh, fuel because the behavior of the fuel in the system is the same. So uh, this is just, I'll just throw this up. Here are the prices. Um, that, that were used. Uh, if you want to get into more detail, it's here in the, in the uh, uh, materials. So clean, again, let's talk a little bit more about clean firm power. Um, uh, here are some of the things that you can include in clean firm power. It could be geothermal, biomass nat with natural gas, um, any kind of clean firm, uh, clean uh, fuel. So it could be methane that's reformed to hydrogen and then the CO2 put underground. It could be uh, uh, blue hydrogen or green hydrogen. Um, it could be uh, advanced nuclear. So any of these things, even though they behave very differently, they're all clean firm power. They're all available for as long as you need it, whenever you need it. Um, California, why do we need clean firm power? Well, the basic fundamental reason we need it is because we could build a lot of renewable energy, but in the winter, that uh, supply of renewable energy goes down dramatically, and both for solar and wind, and especially if we're going to electrify, and especially if we're going to electrify heat, the demand for electricity is going to go up in the winter while the supply is going down. So this is a seasonal mismatch between supply and demand that, that is the, really the biggest reason why we need, um, why we're gonna end up needing clean firm power. And here's another way to look at it. In this graph, you're seeing the um, daily load in the solid line and the more uh, green it is, the more able the uh, renewable energy is able to provide um, provide for all the energy. There's plenty of renewable energy in the summer, but it gets redder and redder. In other words, less of the load is able to be served by renewable energy in the winter when it's not 
not there. So what do we learn? First of all, how much does it cost? We got a, I, what I think is a fairly remarkable result that basically no matter what kind of clean firm power we picked, and they have all different roles in the energy system and all different price ranges, if we, as long as we had roughly 30 gigawatts or so of, of clean firm power, the price of transmission and generation, um, the cost of, the cost of uh, transmission and generation doesn't go up in California, it stays about the same. But if you don't allow these resources, then the price goes up by something like 65%. And it's easy to see why that is, because on the right, you see here how much you, renewable energy you have to build, which is largely redundant. You don't use it most of the time, but you have to overbuild it in order to cover those, um, what we call Dunkelflaute or dark doldrum times in the winter. And so that's why it costs so much more. But it, and because the, um, uh, in this case, I'll go back here, um, these, uh, the utility of the uh, clean firm power is so high that even though it is per kilowatt much more expensive, the system costs are kept low because the utility is so high. And I think that's a, that's a really, that's one of the most important points out of this study. You wanna keep costs low and you wanna keep them sort of what they are today and serve uh, the, especially the um, uh, underprivileged people in California who, who can't afford increases in prices, it's really important that we put in some clean firm power so those prices stay about the same. There may be other reasons that the price of electricity is gonna go up, but we don't want it to have to go up for uh, carbon removal if we don't have to. We looked at a whole bunch of different um, sensitivity studies on price. And basically what you're seeing here is, again, the issue is the utility of the clean firm power is so high that it doesn't really matter much that it's, that it's uh, more costly per kilowatt. And that, this, this is a case now where we're gonna see the long-term issue, uh, the long view of putting these kind of uh, resources in play is, is very important. And if you stuck to the short view, the short-term view, where you would only look at price per kilowatt hour you wouldn't put these in. And it's only by looking at the system costs over the long view that you understand why it's so important to have them. Um, we also looked at long duration storage and I could say too much about this, except that it's only a partial solution uh, for replacement for clean firm power. You still need uh, on the right, uh, if you only have long-term storage and you don't have uh, with clean firm power, you're still gonna be looking at something like 25% increase in costs. So, it's a good complement. Maybe if, as these things come along, there's certainly nothing wrong with trying to do more long-term storage, but it doesn't obviate the need for clean firm power. So how fast does it have to be built? Um, this is a graph which goes right along with the capacity graph we looked at before. If you have to put that capacity in, you've got to build it by 2045. The red line is if you only do the renewables and batteries and don't allow clean firm power. And at the bottom left, you see the current um, build out rate, historic rate, we're talking about many orders of magnitude increase in rate. Um, uh, and then on, on the, the lower wedges there, if you have fuels uh, or gas with CCS or nuclear power, or even all of them, you significantly decrease to well, something comparable to historic rates of growth, um, the ability to, to build out the system. So the more options we have on clean firm power, the less fast we have to build it. So meanwhile, um, you know, if, if for those people that are promoting renewable power, there's nothing wrong with that. The renewable power, it, it, all of these models build a lot of clean, clean uh, of uh, solar and wind, particularly solar. Um, and you can see here all these different uh, portfolios that we put in place and you focus a little bit on the yellow bars here, which are the dark yellow is solar and the light is wind. And you can see, except when you put in nuclear, they pretty much get most of their, uh, most of their uh, capacity built is in, is in solar. So they're still gonna build a lot of solar and the energy uh, that they get, that the system derives from the portfolio is even more focused on solar. And here you, you're just seeing the effect of very low price solar energy. The system wants to build a lot of solar as much as it can without making it so redundant that it becomes more expensive. 
So again, a lot of, a lot of the energy is gonna come from solar. Um, so how much does it need? Well, all of these models built a different amount depending on uh, what they, uh, different amount of clean firm power, but from, you know, a sort of eyeball, uh, it seems like a pretty safe bet that if California put a target on 30 gigawatts at this point, that would probably be a no regret strategy um, for some kind of clean firm power and they can keep it pretty open. Uh, we don't have to sign on to any one kind uh, of clean firm power. Pretty much uh, every kind will, uh, will be helpful. And they all, but uh, on the other side, they all have um, deployment challenges. So obviously on nuclear, there's a law against new nuclear in California until there's a licensed repository. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of public uh, resentment or, or um, that's a, a movement to uh, keep it in the ground on fossil fuels. So the idea of continuing to use gas and sequestering CO2 is difficult for people to believe is a good solution. And, um, would require a lot of retrofit um, uh, available. And then the fuel issue, which isn't on this graph, is, is also quite expensive. Um, on the CCS side, though, uh, which is, from my perspective, one of California's best bets, um, and we'll see this as we go along here even more, because a lot of the facilities for transmitting the, uh, for, for transmission of the electricity, for storage of the gas, for storage of other gases underground is already in place in California. And we have plenty of storage uh, to last up through the rest of the century in even in just depleted oil and gas reservoirs. So I think the, um, I think CCS is probably one of California's best bets. Um, and if we built out nuclear, um, the build out rate, although again, it's uh, gonna be a very hard sell in California is certainly within the scope of what has been done in the past. So these are not crazy changes as the solar, all solar and wind would be. Um, so the role of these uh, uh, different forms of clean firm power is a little bit different. And this is based on some work that EJ did is in the audience, I hope. And if you get questions, I hope she'll answer them. Um, but nuclear power is uh, more like a flexible base and it uh, ramps down a bit um, uh, during the day when you have more solar and so does gas with CCS, but maybe a little bit ramps up a little bit more. And, and these both ramp up at night when there is no solar. And um, the fuels tend to be very expensive. So the systems that build only fuel for clean firm power tend to build a lot more solar and they are used only when they really are needed. But they all work. They can all fill the, the role of uh, solving the Dunkel Flauta problem. And here's a graph showing um, the role that each of these play in a, in a sample day. And you can see the nuclear there in the purple on the upper row ramping down uh, a little bit during the day and the solar pumping in, coming in and CCS coming in even more strongly and the fuel um, being the least uh, pre prevalent of the three and having a lot more yellow, a lot more solar. So, um, so here's another way to look at why it's, uh, it's the least expensive solution, because as you look at um, how much of the load is going to be carried by each of these uh, different sources, and you stay on the, lowest, on the lowest price curve for each of these, you get the first 10% of your load or 10% of the load. The, uh, the, most, the most effective way to deal with it is zero carbon fuel, and then the next piece is from CCS and the next piece from nuclear. So basically what you're doing is optimizing the uh, capacity factors for each of these and therefore um, keeping the cost as low as possible. That's why it, that's why it does that. Um, and this is another way to look at that same thing. I'm, I think I'm gonna move on from this though to get to some other points. So the other issue that's gonna come up is what happens to land use. And um, I think the the difficulty that we see with uh, the high renewable strategy is that it uses a lot of land. And what we saw in the case where it was only renewables and batteries allowed that this, the models were trying to use over 6,000 square miles of California land for utility solar. And that's 
actually quite a bit um, would be uh, very difficult and would probably probably push up against um, barriers that would you know where land use for solar utility wouldn't be allowed or wouldn't be uh, functionally allowed for some reason like you couldn't get the landholders to agree or it's too steep or it's too remote um, uh, or it's on a on public land that's protected it's just, there are many reasons why that um, amount of land may just be very difficult in California and some recent studies uh, are showing that it's it's probably the amount of land that you could probably use for solar is certainly deserves a lot more attention and a lot more analysis, but it's probably less than 6,000 square feet, square miles. And it's still a lot of land. Um, if we if we allow the clean firm power, we're still getting maybe an order of magnitude less, but maybe only like half that, say for the fuel case, if we wanted to go with the fuel case, you still might be using an awful lot of land for solar utility solar. and. So I think one of the big questions that this brings up is what's a realistic assumption about how much land you're actually gonna to dedicate to utility solar because to the extent that um, the, the system can't buy all the solar that it wants to from an economic perspective, it's, it's stopped because of their land use issues, then the push and the need for clean firm power is gonna increase. Uh, likewise, the transmission, one of our, uh, the, the, stamp, the uh, Princeton model looked at transmission increases and found that the, um, uh, that without clean firm power, over 9 million megawatt miles would be needed of new transmission, whereas only two to three, which is still a lot for, um, uh, for clean firm power. And the current amount of megawatt miles in California is about 15. So this is not, this is not a small thing either. And if you can't build all this transmission, um, then again, you're gonna be looking at clean, you know, more clean firm power. And again, I think this is another reason why CCS may turn out to be a godsend because it would, it would necessarily uh, minimize this. And remember, this is not a um, transmission plan. This is the megawatt miles. So this isn't telling you where the actual miles circuit miles of transmission would go and some of them would obviously go along existing trunk lines so um, you know that there's still work to be done to understand this problem how much transmission can you really effectively uh, expect to build by 2045 and if you can't build everything you want to build again more clean firm power so in summary which it doesn't want to do um, clean firm power is going to help keep the uh, costs low about what they are today uh, they are going to, uh, if, we, if we don't build clean firm power, we're looking at building 470 some gigawatts of new solar and wind and the entire generating capacity of the United States is about a thousand gigawatts. So it's a pretty hefty lift, hefty lift anyway, uh, but a daunting lift if you don't build clean firm power. Uh, energy storage, all of these models were allowed to build so, uh, as much short-term battery storage as they, they wanted. Uh, they built a lot, but in the case of, um, of clean firm power, they built a thousand gigawatts uh, hours, thousand gigawatt hours of battery storage. And my numbers here are actually wrong. The largest battery facility in the world is being built in California is actually point, point 0.4 gigawatts or 1.6 gigawatt hours. And that's, um, uh, so you can see there's a huge lift on batteries and, and that's another area where you could question whether the competition for lithium or whatever is actually gonna allow you to get the amount of battery storage that these models really wanna build. Land use, we just talked about um, basically uh, this, I, I, this could be the limiting factor on solar expansion and as could transmission. So keenness is about renewable energy. It's the price is not the limiting factor anymore. The limiting factor is going to be land use, seasonal variability, and transmission issues. So we need to stop thinking about saying, okay, we're all going to do solar because it's just become so cheap. There are other costs, and those other costs are going to be the ones that dominate. Uh, energy storage, um, we're projecting a lot of energy storage and we're just at the beginning of building this kind of 
this uh, ability to store energy in batteries. So I think the, the good question about whether we can get there with only batteries. Um, firm power, um, we can do, we can, the good news is we can keep prices pretty much the same for generation and transmission, but we need clean firm power to do it. And it doesn't matter what kind we build, it really is the system costs are gonna be uh, dominated by the utility of that power. Um, and the, the, uh, uh, the other piece is that if we've led in renewable energy, it's now time for California to lead in clean, clean firm power because if we need it with all the solar and wind that we have, um, a lot of other entities are gonna need it too. So plan for clean firm power, that's number one. Plan for realistic land use and transmission develop some realistic understanding of where we might get to with batteries and plan for some other batteries, other kinds of storage. So um, I think I'll stop there. I have some, a few slides about other questions, but um, I'm sort of at the end of the time, so we'll stop there. Great, uh, terrific, Jane, I appreciate that. We have a lot of audience questions, but first I'd like to call on our own Sally Benson, who is the leader of the Stanford team in the study. And of course you all know as the former uh, director or co-director of the Precord Institute for Energy, our colleague here in uh, energy resources uh, engineering. So Sally, take it away. Uh, I think you're gonna give a kind of set of comments from your own perspective, but also from the participant of one, uh, pr perspective of one of the participating models of the study, Sally. Okay, terrific. Anyway, Jane, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. Great, uh, great talk and summary of what was done. Uh, number one, it was a real pleasure to get to be involved in the study. Um, you know, really uh, top notch um, modeling groups, each bringing something special. Um, but, you know, together, I think, Jane, as you articulated, you know, the, the main conclusion was that some form of clean firm power is going to be needed if we're going to cost effectively and reliably uh, get to a, to a zero emission grid. So, you know, in engaging in academic studies around this topic, it turns out that in, in Europe and, and, um, and the United States, North America, there are actually many studies which, you know, support this notion that um, some kind of firm, you know, clean power is needed. But when you uh, go out into the broader, you know, uh, world of people trying to solve climate and energy problems, there's like a real disconnect between sort of what, you know, the academic community says is known um, uh, based on many, many case studies. And, um, and really, I think the decisions, um, you know, being made in, in policy circles now that really have yet to recognize that, that we need to uh, make progress on this idea that we um, need clean firm power. So sort of a, maybe when we come back to you again, Jane, you know, it's like, how do we address this disconnect? You know, and certainly, you know, your study, I think has gone a long way because it's, you know, very detailed study with specific examples. But I think that um, this is a broader issue that would be helpful for, you know, every region or state or nation trying to contemplate how to do this. So that's sort of my number one observation is that, that there is a real disconnect in what we know um, and think we know. Um, the second one, and, and I'm sure you've heard this, Jane, so many times, is that, that presented with these results, we hear, oh, that nuclear is too expensive and natural gas plus CCS is too expensive that the levelized cost of both of these technologies is, you know, three to four times higher than, you know, solar uh, or wind in, in the best location. And therefore, how could it be possibly true that, um, that, uh, that, that these could play a valuable role in cost effectively decarbonizing? And, and I think that there's a lot of work to do on the idea that what we're trying to optimize is the full system cost. And that by just finding the lowest cost individual technologies, it doesn't lead you to the lowest cost system. And, and uh, anyway, I found there a real challenge to, to try to make um, you know, the argument to support that idea. And I think the shame is that what we're seeing is people are not thinking about investing in these technologies 
you know, natural gas plus CCS as an example, um, you know, in, in the electricity sector, often we hear, oh, well, no, CCS is for industry. But again, you know, this study clearly showed that even though the levelized cost of, of natural gas plus CCS is higher than solar or wind, uh, it makes it so you have overall lowest system cost. Yeah. So that, that's sort of the second point. Um, the third one is, is that if you, um, you know, look at the current policies, you know, nationally and so forth, and, and in California, they're really focused on the next tranche of renewables and, um, and short-term storage. And if we think about these clean firm power technologies, they all have very long lead times. You know, you, you, list, you put up the list of hurdles. And, you know, if we're going to, you know, absolutely need these by 2035, 2040, 2045, whatever you pick the date, I think now is the time when we need to do regional assessments of what are those clean firm power options available uh, in different regions and what kind of policy measures could be put in place so that we don't wait till the last minute, that we basically get to work on those now and give those the long lead times that they will need um, to, to scale up. I've just got two more points. Um, you know, an, another notion that I think we often hear about is that if we have very wide area integration of the electric grid, so for example, if you could um, integrate over an area as broad as WEC, that somehow that the seasonal variability in renewable generation across this vast domain would somehow equalize out and, and therefore um, you know, we wouldn't really need clean firm power, um, maybe at all, or maybe not so much. And, and I think this study really put that issue to bed in some ways. You yeah. know, the, the, the Gen X was a WEC wide model, um, E3 was California model, uh, Herbs was a, a, you know, it's sort of a California plus model. Um, and, uh, and, and again, every single one of them concluded, you know, large amounts of clean firm power would, would be needed and that wide area integration um, uh, is not going to be sufficient. And then finally, just one last point, I think it was also striking that the models which had different geographic domains, um, but they also had very different approaches to dealing with time. Um, in the case of herbs, it was 365 days a year, uh, 24 hours a day. Um, so it really modeled an entire, you know, every single bit of a year. Um, E3 uh, did representative days and, um, and uh, Gen X used uh, representative weeks, I believe. Um, and I think there are many who would have said, oh, well, you know, you can't come up with major conclusions about sort of want, you know, energy storage and so forth, unless you do the 365, 24 hours a day. Um, but, but again, the similarity in all these studies suggests that, that um, you know, appropriately selected, you know, representative days or weeks or whatever, uh, you know, can get you long way towards uh, useful, uh, useful answers. And and, and I think because these three models with such different assumptions were used, it really supports the robustness of the conclusion of the study. So, uh, so those are kind of some reflections on both uh, being engaged in the process, as well as maybe some uh, food for thought that you might want to uh, say something about, Jane. Yeah, that's good points. Um, you know, I think uh, it's been interesting because we've been doing a lot of briefing around the state you know, Cal ISO and PUC and the legislature and um, CEC. And it's like every, everybody's saying, you know, fantastic. We get it. They understand it. And we got to do something about this. And then they kind of fibrillate. You know, I, I think they just don't feel that they have the agency um, to deal with it. And it's really fascinating. Um, Cal ISO probably more than anyone is saying, you know, this is it, we got to do this and then kind of, well, I don't, how do we do it? How do we get there? So I, I think the answer, part of the answer is 
kind of simply simple conceptually, although I know it gets much more cr uh, complicated in practice because of community aggregators and who's responsible for this, you know, who's actually going to buy it. But on one level, if you can figure out what entities to nail on this, you know, saying there's a mandate here, you have to build this and we're going to allow you to get cost recovery. You know, that, and you have to start, you know, you can build whatever you want. You can do whatever experimentation you need, but you need to have X, you know, gigawatts by such and such a time and X more by, you know, 10 years later. And you figure it out. Um, I think, I think that would be wonderful because, but people aren't going to do it until they can get cost recovery because exactly uh, the point you made is, is the, the, um, the cost per, per kilowatt now is just much higher. So we, we're trying to force this uh, system view, um, which pretty much nobody has. You know? So the only way to, to do that is, is to, to, just like we said, when renewable energy was expensive, we still said you have to do it. And then, gee, guess what happened? The cost came down. So I think, um, I think that's one aspect of it that's, that's, um, that's really important. Um, and, and based on you know, kind of what I've been seeing, I, I think there's a strong role for legislation here. You know, just like we had a, a portfolio standard for renewable energy, I think, you know, I think getting some kind of legislation that mandates, again, that, that takes SB 100 to the next level and just says, okay, um, here's, here's what you have to do on clean from power. And just and keep in mind, you know, don't get worried about, I'm not worried about them going on a strong push for solar right now. You know, they have to build, a, you know, the, these models want a lot of solar, want an awful lot of solar. They're not going to have a regret strategy by uh, building solar as fast as they can. So I think that's, that's another piece of good news. Um, the policy is not, um, is not bad. Um, and, you know, I think uh, we get asked a lot about uh, demand side management and regionalization, and that's going to solve all the problem. Well, you know, Saudi make a great point. These models included all that stuff. You can't get out of this. You know, this is, uh, there's, you know, if you, you want to wave your arms at some idea that you think is going to make this go away, it, it's, it's been put in and you can't get out of it that way. So I, I, I think we have a very strong case. I think the people are hearing us, they get it. They sort of thought this was true and now the data is there. Now they can see it. So the question is who has the authority, who ha who's gonna take the responsibility? And I think that those are complicated questions in our environment, but conceptually, I think it's pretty simple. You gotta have a mandate and you gotta have a cost recovery. Great, thanks. Yes, so maybe John, back over to you. Okay, thank you. That was terrific. Uh, we're now up to 36 audience questions. I'll try to consolidate them a little. Most of them are very uh, rah rah. We uh, we uh, understand, agree, and strongly endorse what you're doing. I'd say maybe half, uh, maybe a quarter are. Um, uh, why don't you even do this one step further? And uh, some of them are kind of questioning cost and uh, you know upstream uh, clean fuel, uh, power uh, emissions and whatnot. But uh, let me organize it this way. Uh, I would like to get back to your recommendations on what policies you think would, regulations and policies you think would be best. But uh, since there was a lot of uh, talk about technologies in the presentation, a lot of questions rega regarding that, I'll break it up into a couple of sub subcomponents. Uh, so did you consider in the category of uh, clean firm power, Things like deep hot rocks, fusion, solar concentrating, solar thermal, and the like, or not, and if not, why not? I guess uh, I think people are trying to give you more ideas to add to the portfolio well, by and large. So, so all of those those kind of things, for the most part, are are going to um, be functionally, you know, are going to have a function that's similar to what we mm -hmm. we put in the model. And so once it's functionally similar, then the issue is really what price range we use and did that price range include that technology? So I think, um, you know, for example, uh, zero emission CCS, you know, if we get alum cycle, the price drops dramatically, right? Um, so 
you know, or if you got fusion, then, you know, I don't know whether it would be more or less. I've spent enough time at Livermore and I not think that it's obvious. So, um, you know, I, uh, deep, you know, geothermal, uh, for example, would behave much like CCS in terms of functionality. So in terms of the model, it's just a price range. And I think, so the answer is not explicitly, but it doesn't change the results very much. Yeah, alongside that, there is concern that you left out, I think I know the answer to this, fugitive emissions from gas, uh, air emissions from CCS, other than uh, on yeah. the climate side, nuclear waste and things yeah. like that. Yeah, so I, I think that the, I mean, we were looking at some of the ancillary impacts. So the next step is really for California to, to choose, right? What kind of clean from power? So you got, you got this thing you have to do with how much land can we actually use to get the solar? How much transmission can we actually build? What kind of clean from power is California gonna build? Which of these obstacles are we gonna to try to overcome for these? And along with that is the very important question of what is gonna be the short-term forcing that results from that choice. So if you go on a hydrogen uh, economy now, if you move to a hydrogen as a clean fuel pool, there's work that's being ongoing at EDF showing that the fugitive emissions of hydrogen can pretty much negate the, the climate benefits of using hydrogen if you don't do it carefully and you don't do it right. So, you know, those are that strategic plan of which you choose and why. We didn't do that. That has to get done. You know, we're just saying, look, you know, you choose whichever ones are the best, but choose something. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, it's gonna be a lot more expensive. And Another set of technology questions regarding the future of transportation here in the state. So um, you know, one questioner even suggested that you do a, um, a stage two uh, version of this study where you put more emphasis on that. So how do you think about that, including Oh, how many EVs are on the road, charging capacity? If you're gonna go with EVs, how about hydrogen, small vehicles, big vehicles and whatnot? You know, I, I, a couple of years ago, I led the um, CCST study on gas storage, evaluating gas storage for the state. And I wanted to know after uh, Aliso Canyon, you know, was it safe? Could it be made safe? Did we need it? Were we gonna need it in the future? And you know, gas, just as an example, gas is used both for electricity and heat. And, uh, and fossil fuels are used for transmission, uh, for transportation and electricity is used for transportation. And one of the things that came completely obvious to us is that there's no really good integrated model of the whole thing. Um, so, you know, you will we'll get a view on gas that has to do just with electricity or just with, with uh, uh, core customers who want, who use it for heat. And you don't ever get the integration of the whole thing. It's very difficult to do because a lot of the information is proprietary, but I think that, you know, that question is really important. We need, you know, even if it's a toy model at this point to have some kind of, um, uh, model that gave us a, an accurate, if not precise, uh, understanding of how all of that fits together. And I totally agree with a, that comment. We need that. Great. Uh, super. Uh, in respect of our uh, August visitor this year at Stanford remotely, I uh, might say Amory Levins, uh, you'll not be surprised to hear uh, several audience members are uh, asking another set of whatabouts, and that is about energy efficiency. As you know, Amory is also mm -hmm. going for a system-wide um, benefit of kind of integrated uh, energy demand and end use system. So I assume Amory has talked to you or you've talked to Amory or okay. people like him, especially if you're working with, yeah, but if you're working with EDF, I think he has his uh, disciples and former uh, employees there as well. So how do you, how, how are you thinking about energy efficiency? Well, people, into, I mean, these all included demand side management at some uh, point, uh, right? They, right, they right. include that. I mean, I, I you just have to do that. I think one of the problems with um, with efficiency and is uh, it leads to a little bit of rebound. And I I don't really understand how um, uh, you know the I think it's there's poorly quantified understanding of where we can get to. I think that a lot of it sounds really good and uh, could be really good, but uh, in terms of modeling something like this, I think we, we do run into the problem of not having really good data. Data, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, there is a, an effort to develop better data, but I, I've been trying to do that for 40 years, as you know, and it's hard, yeah. it's still hard. Maybe yeah. it'll be easier in the age of big data, but we'll see. The problem that it does bring up another problem though is is the, the true believer problem, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, and I I I think what what we've accomplished here is um, there's no there's no true believers there's no there was no real true belief underlying true. It, right it was. Uh, yeah, apropos of another guy you brought into our group at Livermore, I really like this uh, evolutionary theory um, approach that. You try a lot of things and see if you can demonstrate them in the real world. It's kind of the Jeff Be Bezos mantra. And then the things that don't work, you kill them off like dogs. And the ones that do work, you up the ante and uh, quadruple, uh, you know, multiply them by a hundredfold. I would like to spend a little bit of time because you brought it up and I think people are interested in this in policy. A lot of the questions were, we need policies to push in your direction. We have to stop pushing renewables so much. We have to stop banning natural gas hookups and, and whatnot. So I'm gonna uh, ask you to continue your, your nice list, which yeah. I was trying to jot down, of the, you personally who has done so much work over the, since I've known you on looking at different systems and all these uh, model, model things, non-modeling things. In your expert opinion, um, I know you speak to the legislature, what would you recommend as say the three or four most important things that they ought to be seriously considering and ultimately doing something on? Well, fundamentally, they need a strategic plan to get it to get to 2045, right? I mean, that, and you sort of look at the strategic plan, they need some answers to questions that they don't have. They have to, they have to do a study to figure out how much land they're going to dedicate, you know, is, is you know, is 6,000 square miles of California even close to what they're going to have? So I think I think it's possible to take every square inch of California and put it in a bin, whether it could be used or not, you know, and figure it out. You know, how, what's the upside? When, what's the range? Um, second thing, you know, if, if you put in all the transmission that you can, um, oh, sorry, uh, solar you can, are you limited by transmission? What What is a realistic transmission plan? So they need that strategy. And then they, starting even before that, they really need the plan for which um, clean firm power they're gonna go with, how they're gonna get 30 gigawatts. I put the challenge out there. How are you gonna get 30 gigawatts? And, um, that's, and that's just a starting number. You may need a lot more. So, you know, what is the, um, what's the plan for getting there? And I, so I think those, if you did those three things, um, well, and as well, something on batteries. I mean, there's some people, some of our group um, felt that the batteries were just not going to be a problem, that the, the battery industry was going to zoom forward mainly because of transportation. And so we're going to be able to get plenty of batteries to do what we want to do. I'm a little more skeptical, but I, I you know, I'm willing to put that in a, in a slightly less concerned box. I, I think the land use is huge. And siting and you know siting and getting permits for the transmission, huge. So they just they really got to bite the bullet on that, and then just saying you know here's here's the mandate you gotta you gotta get this clean firm power, and we'll let, you know we'll, we'll let you we'll let you recover costs that already came in. But uh, just to get an idea of how deeply you went into land use, because I think it's tremendously important, and you hear this as a more general thing. Uh, it's a separate question, and that is, what do you do with solar in urban areas? Is it parking lots, rooftops, car tops? Uh, somebody said maybe you put it on you, uh, uh, you know, uh, streetlight tops. Um, how, how do you think about that? I know in, in general uh, around the world, there's that big issue. If you're in, uh, say, Beijing, what do you do with solar? Do you sprinkle yeah. it on the wet, wet tops? Do you put it? remotely far away and then have to build a lot of transmission, transmission. and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. That's part of your strategic plan. So I, I talked to a friend in New Jersey and he said that the state is utility is doing a lot of rooftop solar. And I said, well, how are you avoiding? I mean, one of the issues here also is equity and equity is not just about the price of electricity, which is the one thing that we've uh, dealt with here. It's also about who, um, who pays uh, for the system costs of providing this resource. So if you're like me and put solar on your roof because you were tired of having your power go out when every time we had a fire, fire um, the rest of the community is subsidizing us um, because we don't pay for electricity anymore. 
um, but everybody else has to still pay for everything, you know, the other things that are being done in the electricity. Yeah. So that equity problem uh, uh, comes up very seriously. So in New Jersey, he said, well, the utility is going to own all this power on people's roof. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I don't know enough about that to know what the right answer is, but I do think that, um, you know, that real estate's there. It's nice to use it. It is more expensive uh, to get that kind of solar energy, but maybe that price difference doesn't make a huge difference. I don't really know. Uh, but the but the equity problem is, I think, a serious problem and has to be dealt with. And, and likewise, you know, and, and all of this equity has to be dealt with because if we're going to build, you know, clean firm power facilities, in whose neighborhood are we going to build them? Um, you know, I, I think that one of the things we have to work towards is broadening the context of those decisions, because as we go to a clean firm, a, a clean energy system, for example, air pollution is going to be diminished for everybody. Uh, so, you know, we um, we were riding our bikes down by the bay the other day, and the traffic was just stopped on eighty, just stopped, full stop, <laughs> and it was so quiet and so clean. Wow. You know, I I think. I think basically we have to try to understand these things in as broad a context as we can. Super. Uh, two, uh, two more questions, hopefully both not too hard. Uh, one is everybody wants your slides and how to get more detail on the report. <laughs> is there a quick answer to that? or Yeah, so um, ED, EDF uh, uh, that, what is EDF.org slash clean from power. We'll link to uh -huh. this. And if somebody wants the slides, um, just send me an email. I, yeah, uh, you can send I haven't them. been a, able to convince C, uh, EDF to put them on the web. So I'll yeah, yeah. If you could send them to Sarah Weaver, our seminar coordinator, yeah. she could distribute because people are already asking her about that. And finally, uh, as you move into your um, up close and personal with the students, since you had such a long, illustrious, path-breaking <laughs> career, what advice would you give to young people, <laughs> current students, about what kind of careers to pursue to help in this challenge that you laid out for us with with actually some uh, solutions in it? Well, uh, you know, I think, uh, I, I think this, these students, I think the students of today should be giving us advice <laughs> about how to think about these problems. I think we screwed it up pretty badly. <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the main thing is, uh, you know, to think, think broadly enough about this. That's a that's as you get into solving these problems to make make sure that you think broadly enough, you know that the narrow minded solutions and also to really really avoid um, putting yourself in a career path that depends on an ideological approach to the solution. Pragmatism is what we need. Yeah, yeah. As as one of my uh, personal mentors, you remind me of my uh, original, the original uh, founder of Modern Systems Analysis, C. West Churchman at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. uh, and you you give a great uh, pitch at all levels, even this more uh, little smaller uh, kind mm -hmm. of policy thing. If you don't take the systems uh, approach, you might not be happy with what you want done. With. Yeah. So on that note, I thank you for an expiring uh, seminar that, in that direction. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing the study with us. Amongst all your other gigs around the state, we really appreciate it. Mainly Thanks again, Jay. <laughs> Bye -bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.